um, in different ways. Unfortunately, two of the speakers couldn't make it, but this left us coincidentally with two speakers tackling uh, the postcard. So uh, <laughs> it's, it, it turned out quite, quite nice. Um, and yeah, the postcard is often dismissed as a pure carrier of information and not necessarily appreciated uh, for its form, but only for the words posed on it by a certain sender to a certain receiver. And I think that the two talks uh, that we hear today will teach us better. Um, so first I'd like to welcome uh, Dr. Jessica schuholm Grube. She is Associate Professor in Art History and Coordinator of Research in Art, hist uh, in Art History at Stockholm University. Her research interests include modern art, public art, art and transnationalism, and feminist historiography. Her current research project, Swedish Artists en Route, Mobility, Transnationalism and Artistic Practices in the Early 20th Century, details on the diversity of arti uh, artistic itineraries in the early 20th century and historicizes the meanings and politics of mobility through analysis of how it was visualized, narrativized and habitualized in artistic practices. And then secondly, I'd like to welcome uh, Przemysław Strojek, who is an assistant professor at the Institute of Art of the Polish Acad Academy of Sciences and an associate researcher and curator at the Archiv der Avantgarden, Staatliche Kunstsammlung Dresden. He is the author of several dozen academic, academic articles and published extensively on sport and the avant-garde, as well as on sport and contemporary art. I'm very happy to welcome you too. Thank you. So let's start with the microphone. Do you hear me? Oh, yes, you do hear me now. I can hear that you can hear me. <laughs> so then I'm just waiting for the PowerPoint before I start. Oh, there it is. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, thank you to the organizers, in particular, Laura Colvelto, who uh, has arranged this event so uh, successfully. Uh, and uh, I really enjoyed it. And thank you for having me here. Um, all right, let's start, perfect. So, standardized postcards for postal traffic were introduced on the European market in the early 1870s. Postcards offered an easy, speedy means of communication and was used by individuals and commercial businesses alike. By the turn of the 20th century, most postcards were provided with images and thus transformed into an intertextual medium. Written communication was reduced to short greetings and the pictorial language of the image turned into the key feature of the card and the message in itself. Pictorial postcards reached an enormous popularity and the practices of collecting them grew into a popular obsession, a postcard craze. And uh, this popularity is suggested by this first image, which shows a, a store in Vienna by the turn of uh, the century specializing in trading with the postcards. In the context of art history, though, picture postcards have predominantly received scholarly attention if and when they have been employed as an artistic medium in a proper sense. That is, either as unique painted postcards, as the ones you can see here by members of the uh, Die Brücke, um, Elsa Lasker-Schüler and uh, Franz Marc, or if uh, they were printed postcards that were authorized by the artists, such as the postcards with images by uh, Paul Klee or design by Ludwig Hirschfeld-Mack uh, Hirschfeld that were produced for the 1923 Bauhaus exhibition in Weimar. In this paper, though, I will focus on the mundane, mass-produced pic picture postcards with cheap standardized reproductions in black and white. 
I will elucidate on their importance for the promotion, dissemination, circulation and reception of avant-garde art. The postcard series uh, produced by the Berlin Gallery uh, Der Sturm will serve as a case in point, even though I want to stress at the start here that uh, the Sturm was not alone in this. Uh, several other galleries and also art magazines uh, launched similar postcard uh, series. But let's turn our attention to Der Sturm. Already from its foundation in 1912, the Sturm Gallery in Berlin traded in picture postcards. During the 1910s, several series were put on sale at the entrance of the gallery premises and in the Sturm bookstore, and they were continuously advertised through the magazine Der Sturm. The Sturm postcards were intended as commercial advertising for the artists represented by the gallery. The production and dissemination of postcards was a promotion strategy that the founder of Sturm, the musician, critic and dealer, Havat Walden, borrowed from contemporary marketing practices, where all types of businesses used postcards as an advertising medium on a large scale. As such, the Sturm postcards materialized the connection between avant-garde aesthetics, the art market, and commercial strategies for consumer impact. The Sturm launched its first postcard series, which was called Gemälde der Futuristen, in 1912, following an exhibition of the Italian futurist artist in the gallery. The images reproduced on the postcards were all included in the show. Among them, Umberto Boccioni is the laugh and the farewells, as we can see here. Uh, the Gemälde de Futuristen series was characterized by its clever utilization of the postcards' possibilities for intertextual communication. Printed on the back of each card was a description of the reproduced artwork, directing the beholder's attention to particular aspects of the pictorial language. These texts were identical to the descriptions that had been published in the exhibition catalogue, turning the postcards into fragmented exhibition catalogues, as it were. Notably, the printed texts explicitly point to the images both denotative and connotative levels. For instance, the description of uh, the laugh that you can see to the left explicates that the scene is set at a restaurant table. And to the right, the text informs us that uh, the front view of a train is shown in the upper part of the picture. The printed text thus helped the beholder to decipher and decide the denotative meaning of the images whose fragmented pictorial spaces challenged conventional mimetic standards. Other statements on those cards transgress the descriptive and suggest connotative or contextual meaning. It is noted to the left that the laugh is an image that looks as if it, were ta it was taken with x-rays. And it is noted to the right that the wavy lines that we can see um, transgressing the image, these lines connect the figures with the objects like chords. The reference to x-rays and musical chords situated or anchored, uh, to speak with Roland Barthes, uh, the futurist paintings in a context of modernity's scientific visuality and contemporary aesthetic theories where comparisons between the expressive means of art and music were to become frequent. The printed texts were a means to model the beholder's response to the reproduced artworks and served as an intervention into the public reception of futurist art. In 1913, Herbert Walden, together with his business partner and wife, the artist and art collector Nell Walden, traveled across Europe to recruit artists for the Erste Deutsche Herbstsalon which turned into the perhaps most important international survey exhibition of modernist art shown in Germany before the outbreak of war. In connection with the exhibition, the Walden couple launched another series of postcards with reproductions of some of the artworks included in the show. Among them, as we can see here, works by Gabriele Münter, Max Chagall and Gino Severini. 
From now on, the Waldenkopper refrained from printing explanatory texts on the back of the cards. Instead, the reproduced images were the postcard's major trait. Put on sale at the exhibition venue, the postcards metaphorically allowed the visitors to take along one part of the event. As a token or a souvenir from the exhibition, the postcard offered material ground for the memories of experiencing the original artworks in the exhibition. But the reproductions on small portable postcards also transformed the reception of the images into something tactile and intimate, but also into something that was dislocated and ca characterized by a contextual plurality. With a postcard as an image carrier, you can send avant-garde by mail. The postcard could end up practically everywhere. In 1917, uh, the Waldens introduced uh, a new series, and this time it included images of artworks in Nell Walden's rapidly growing art collection. At the time, she possessed some 300 artworks by leading Sturm artists, including, as we can see here, early uh, abstract works by Vasily Kandinsky and uh, Franz Marc's uh, iconic uh, painting, uh, The Yellow Cow. If the art collection presented artworks in a relatively permanent setting in the Walden private home, the postcards inherently defied the stability of location. Once they entered into postal traffic, as Liliana Weisberg has pointed out, there was no real privacy for the message or the artwork, and they would always reach a further audience. Circulation and public visibility was, of course, precisely the point. The Sturm Gallery employed the postcards as a means to maximize public awareness of its endeavors, and the gallery owed much of its, of its success to have at Walden's infamous talent for this kind of marketing. Postcards transfer the pictorial language of the original artwork into multiple commodities of mass printing. Obviously, colors, size, and the fracture of paintings were lost when they were translated into a standardized format on cheap paper in black and white. But mass dissemination was the higher goal. Questions of quality or even similarity seem to be of secondary importance. And this is suggested by the fact that, as you can see, Kandinsky's built, uh, which you see at the top here, was reproduced upside down, and not only on this postcard, but this was sort of uh, recurring in other printed material disseminated by the Sturm uh, Publishing House. One postcard in the Samlung Walden series showed a photograph, as you can see here, of the Walden couple in their dining room with key works by Marc Chagall hanging on the wall uh, behind them, and these works were from Nell Walden's art collection. Uh, Jeremy Braddock has suggested that art collections served as provisional institutions that helped shape the public reception of modern art before it was canonized and institutionalized in modern art museums. Nell Walden's art collection fulfilled precisely this function within the Sturm organization. The collection was open to the public several times a week and provided a complement to the gallery exhibitions. The collection display, <coughs> excuse me, the collection display uh, in the private home and the dissemination of this postcard with the Waldens in the dining room together manifested how modern art could be incorporated in the domestic interior in an appropriate way and thus provided a sales argument to potential buyers. The Sturm also distributed the so-called Sturmkünstler series with photographic portraits of key contributors to the Sturm gallery and magazine. Artists and authors were presented in a numbered series. Taken together, these postcards performantly produced a unifying collectivity of cultural actors subsumed under the trademark of the Sturm. It served to strengthen the corporate identity of the Sturm enterprise and to symbolically mark its territory on the art market. 
The Walden couple included their own portrait photographs as part of the Sturmkünstler series. As we can see, these portraits conform to well-established formulas of conventional portrait photography and thus align to a broader visual culture of predominantly bourgeois self-fashioning at the time. At least in the eyes of the contemporary beholder, there is a peculiar contrast between the radicality of the Sturm circle in cultural matters and the traditionalism of their visual self-presentations. But that was probably the purpose. The critical reception of modernism in the press at the time also entailed prejudices against the artist as a social type. Widespread dissemination of images like these would help counter the stereotype of the bohemian slacker and act as visual tokens of social respectability. This kind of self-fashioning could backfire, though. In the 1920s, Raoul Hausmann appropriated a postcard with Herbert Walden's portrait in order to discredit him and to imply that his commercial interests made him incompatible with an avant-garde agenda. Over Walden's face, Hausmann added inscriptions in abusive language, describing Walden as a capitalist Jesus and the Sturm Enterprise as a bourgeois rise of expressionism. Thereafter, Hausmann sent the postcard with cordial salutations to Theo van Dorsberg. Nell Walden was perhaps more successful in her entanglement of modernist aesthetics and self-conscious self-fashioning. In the photographs that you can see to the left, uh, sorry, to the right, uh, taken by Wanda von Diebschis-Kunowski, Nell Walden is wearing a skirt and a scarf made by fabric designed by Sonia Delaunay in Paris. The portrait was part of a corpus of photographs showing pr uh, prominent personalities of the contemporary transnational avant-garde, all of them posing in Delaunay's so-called simultaneous fashion design. Delaunay herself collected these images and used them as a photographic gallery that helped her establish simultané as a trademark for the clothing and applied arts that she marketed through her boutique simultané in Paris in the 1920s and 30s. Obviously, uh, the Waldens would use the, uh, the postcards in their daily communications, as we saw here, the handwriting of, of the Walden couple on their own um, postcards. Uh, so they would use them in the daily practices of communicating with friends, family and business partners. As promotional material, these postcards were also sent along with the artworks when the Sturm organized traveling exhibitions in Germany and abroad. During the First World War, the postcards also served the German Kulturpropaganda, at least implicitly so. During the war, the Walden couple actively cooperated with the German authorities. Both Havat and Nell Walden spread pro-German propaganda in neutral states such as the Netherlands and the Scandinavian countries. In exchange, the German authorities guaranteed guaranteed free passages of artworks across the closed borders so that the Sturm Gallery could operate on art markets beyond the war zone. In 1918, preparing for a travel exhibition in Copenhagen, which was evidently planned as part of the uh, Kulturpropaganda, Havert Walden wrote to his contact at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Berlin and asked of this contact that he would send 1,000 Sturm postcards to the German embassy in Copenhagen. And Walden also announced that more packages were to, uh, were to follow and obviously the postcards were going to be spread among the public uh, in Copenhagen. In these travel exhibitions, uh, German artists such as William Wauer, uh, as you can see here, both uh, uh, sculptures were shown in Copenhagen in uh, 1918, uh, but also artists such as uh, Heinrich Kampendonck were shown side by side with artists from neutral countries such as Jacoba van Hemsker from the Netherlands, but also uh, the artists that were now called enemy artists due to the war, such as Marc Chagall. In other words, the group exhibitions of Sturm visually manifested that art transcends nationalism and political con conflict. 
From the perspective of, of the German authorities, the travel exhibitions of Sturm in the neutral countries was also a means to counter the public perception of the German people as uncultivated barbarians. The postcards that complemented the visual material of the artworks in the exhibitions potentially prolonged the effect and resonance of these messages. As I mentioned before, picture postcards soon turned into collectibles. They were assembled and organized in albums produced for this purpose only. One has to presume that this applied to the Sturm postcards too. In fact, Sturm postcards are marketed at collectibles still today, sometimes at surprisingly high prices. However, due to the ephemeral character and low status of mass-produced picture postcards, they have only rarely been institutionalized or archived. Nell Walden's own uh, postcard album has entered the collections of the Stadt, uh, Staatsbibliothek zu Berlin, but seems to be an exception, and therefore we have limited knowledge of how precisely they were used or uh, collected. And these images are uh, from uh, Nell Walden's uh, postcard album uh, in Berlin, and they all show images that were part of her collection. All the paintings are, uh, have been destroyed or are missing, so in fact we are left with uh, the reproduced uh, works on those postcards as source material. Some of the postcards that are still circulating on the, art mar uh, on the market today have material traces, though, that at least give some clues to the, the uses. These postcards are from the Erste Deutsche Herbstsalon series. On the back of each card, there was uh, or is a caption informing on the artist and the title of the artworks. But the inscriptions that you can see on the image side of the cards, and they are all made in the same handwriting, suggest that these postcards at some point were placed in such a way that the text on the verso wasn't accessible and that the information about the artist and the title therefore needed to be added to the front side. We can only speculate uh, if they were once kept in an album and part of a larger collection, but the inscriptions clearly suggest so. Sometimes the inscriptions indicate uh, how the images were received. The added text on this card from the Sturm series suggests that the card circulated or was kept as a source for amusement or even ridicule. In English translation, uh, this inscription reads, To Russia, donkeys and others. That is the name of this beautiful picture, which can certainly have a stimulating effect and be fruitful for the Fliegenden Blätter. And uh, Fliegenden Blätter was a satirical journal uh, published in Germany, and uh, the author thus uh, explicitly proposes that Chagall's imagery qualifies as a basis for mockery in such a context. So, in order to wrap up and summarize, uh, I have tried to show in this paper that the picture postcards of the Sturm galleries are material traces that reveal how a prominent gallery would capitalize on contemporary marketing strategies in order to disseminate the aesthetic ideals of the avant-garde. The postcards were used as a means to intervene in the public reception of modernist art. The postcard's inherent function to circulate relocated the images in diverse contexts that inevitably changed their meaning and function. In sum, postcards like these provide primary sources that help us understand the entanglement between avant-garde art, the promotional apparatus of the capitalist art market, political propaganda, private consumption, and social self-fashioning. Thank you for listening. Do you hear me well or not? Not yet? Oh, okay. Do you hear me now? Not yet. Okay. I'll wait a little bit.
now? Do you hear me? Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jessica, for your wonderful presentation. When I, when I was listening to it, I was thinking there should be a publication on avant-garde postcards <laughs> entirely. I hope it will, uh, yeah, it will get fruition one day. Um, uh, thank you very much for organizing this conference. It's like a really big pleasure to be here and to present uh, my research. Uh, I didn't know that uh, before I started to, uh, to, uh, to prepare this presentation, I didn't know about political situation which will happen right now with, the, with this horrible invasion in, in Ukraine. And uh, actually my, um, my paper will have some kind of reflections to it. I didn't know it at the beginning that it will have, but uh, uh, that it will be so contemporary topic. But when we think about uh, sport and politics, they were always very close bond together. So I would like to uh, focus on the series Spartakiada by uh, Gustav Kluchis, um, and uh, it will be a kind of a close reading of those uh, nine postcards. Uh, I would like to start with the quotation. Uh, our Spartakiad is sharply distinct from the bourgeois Olympics now taking place in Amsterdam. At those games, there is an attempt to achieve victories at any cost and establish new records. Defending national honor with specially prepared athletes is an end in itself. The Spartakiad has the task of demonstrating physical culture and sport as one form of preparing workers in the struggle for socialism. End of quote. It's what the head of organizing committee Avel Anukidze wrote in the official report of the first All Union Spartakiad in 1928. The Spartakiad was organized by the communist sporting organization called the Red Sport International, which was excluded from the International Olympic Committee and organized counter Olympics for the working class. The first All Union Spartakiad in Moscow, scheduled for the 10th to the 22nd of August 1928, as an international worker sport event, was meant to surpass in its size the 8th Olympic Games in Paris in 1924 and the 9th Olympic Games in Amsterdam 1928. Even if the Moscow event was hailed as the first All Union Spartakiad, the very first Spartakiad was organized in Prague in 1921, and the main organizer of it was a member of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia, Jiří Chałupecki. It was Chałupecki who came up with the name Spartakiad for the international workers' sporting events. The name referred to Spartacus, the leader of the uprising of enslaved people and gladiators in ancient Rome. Spartacus connected three ideas, proletariat, social revolution, and physical education. In July 1928, a second Spartakiad supposed to be held in Prague, but it was banned by the Czechoslovak government. A poster and a series of five postcards survived, which were aimed at spreading the visual propaganda of the event. One of the postcards depicted a runner, a worker athlete wearing a sport jersey with a red star, set against the backdrop of the letter S with an FPT, an acronym for the Communist Organization Federation of Proletarian Physical Culture, then the date, 1928, and the name of the city, Praha, Prague. Another postcard uh, featured a photomontage here including images that show endless crowds at sporting events right next to crowds at mass demonstrations. I'm talking about the one below. Uh, and these two contexts are just juxtaposed with a portrait of Vladimir Lenin inscribed within a red star. Two of the postcards prepared for the event were illustrated by the graphic designer and a member of the Communist Party of Czechoslovakia, Václav Mašek. The set of five postcards for the second Spartakiad in Prague, created between 1926 and 1927, preceded the creation of the set of nine postcards by Kluchis for the first All Union Spartakiad in Moscow. It was around June 1928 that the Supreme Council of Physical Culture and the 
Red Sport International officials commissioned Kluchis to design propaganda postcards with a deadline of August 2nd, 1928, just 10 days before the opening. In a letter to his companion, Valentina Kulagina, dated 31st July 1928, Kluchis informed that he was still working on the project and would probably not meet the deadline. I quote, the work has turned out to be much more complex than I supposed. A great deal of work, 16 parts each, consisting of a small montage. About 18 include diagrams, the signature, and the overall montage of the poster. End of quote. A week later, on August 6, he wrote that he could not complete his work, having been be by then already exceeded the deadline set by Red Sport International by four days. It is likely, therefore, that the series of nine official postcards and a poster that ultimately completed was um, only released once the first All Union Spartakiad in Moscow had already gone, gotten underway. The correspondence with Kulagina uh, testifies that Kluchis was very much devoted to the project and was working intensively for several, several weeks using various photos from the daily press, sport and photographic journals to create a montage configuration of sports disciplines. Javelin throw, discus throw, cycling, motorcycling, water diving, rowing, riding, long jump, equestrian sports, relay, football, shot put, shooting, and tennis. The Spartakiad series by Klutzis uh, comprised of nine postcards, which all measured 14.1 and 10.5 centimeters. Similarly to the postcards prepared for the second Spartakiad in Prague, each of them contained the title of the event, Spartakiada, the place, Moscow, and the date, 1928. They also included the acronym of the Red Sport International, RSI, and the artist's name, Klutzis. Seven of the postcards included inscriptions in Russian, two of them inscriptions in German. Spartakiada, Moscow, and, and Klutzis. There, there are two posters which were uh, produced in German. Kruzic was uh, most uh, probably not familiar with uh, designs of the postcards created in Prague, but one can see some similar solutions uh, to promote the activities of the same communist worker sport organization. Firstly, in typography, where the when the postcards uh, with a runner from Prague matches uh, with the footballer postcard uh, by Kluchis, both showing the worker athletes entangled with a massive letter S to express how modern typography was linked to bodily movement. And secondly, the use of photomontage presenting the images of masses and effigy of Vladimir Lenin, both in Prague and in Kluchis series. In the series of nine postcards uh, for the Moscow event, the photographs of various sports disciplines have been assembled with photographs of the communist city landmarks, the Lenin Mausoleum and Red Square, images of political demonstrations and effigies of Vladimir Lenin, who died four years before. The cut-out photographs of the crowds at the demonstrations were supposed to reflect the real crowds at the Spartakiad, that is, those who would attend the event as spectators in the stadiums and, the, and as athletes on the pitch. Unlike the set of postcards for Prague, which featured illustrations by Václav Maszek, the series by Kluchis was entirely composed in the technique of photomontage. The compositions appear to correspond to the compositional principles that Kluchis articulated in his text, the photomontage as a new kind of agitation art. I quote, the essence of photomontage is the use of the physical mechanical power of the camera optics and chemistry for the purposes of agitation propaganda. In replacing the hand drawing with a photograph, the artist depicts a particular moment in a manner more truthful, more lifelike, more comprehensible to the masses. The photomontage, which simultaneously organizes a number of formal elements, photo, color, slogan, line, surface, has a single purpose, to achieve maximum power of expression. The photomontage has created a new type of revolutionary postcard." End of quote. 
Kluchis arranged uh, existing photographs from the illustrated press in such a way as to create new meanings and to circulate them to the masses via the postcard format. Photographic reproductions were the visual language of current events intended to be more comprehensible to the proletarian masses and mass circulation. One photographic reproduction, uh, one photographic reproduction, a female tennis player that was featured in the issue six of Sovietskoye Photo from June 1928 appeared in his tennis postcard. Kruchis included then also photographs of athletes from Soviet workers' clubs, such as a female dis discus player at the Moscow Sports Club Trut, or a tennis player at the Dynamo Moscow, as well as the shot putter from the team of the city of Moscow. The postcard with a female discus thrower featured even... Oh, sorry. Uh, featured even... Uh, the postcard with a female discus thrower featured even German athletes. They are on the bottom. Uh, from the women, de women department Frauenabteilung Neukölln Sport Club in Berlin. This fact was a tes testimony that athletes who appeared in the postcard series were not entirely representatives of Soviet sport. Spartakiad postcards from 1928 uh, featured photographs of many sporting disciplines and these were connected to specific colors. For example, Kluchis used the color green to suggest the color of the stadium pitch, used in the context of football and javelin throw, blue to suggest the color of water in water sports, diving and canoeing, yellow to suggest the color of the racetrack and sand, relay race and long jump, and red to suggest the ideas of communism. The only postcard with an entirely red background featured a slogan every worker athlete must be a soldier of the revolution in German and every athlete must be a good shot in Russian. It showed montaged photographs of sport shooters, soldiers and ordinary proletarian aiming at a shooting target and silhouettes of female soldiers carrying rifles. The postcard with a striking red background thus mediated an ideological and pro-military uh, message. Thanks to military training, there will be women and men who will become future soldiers and will fight for the victory of communism. The Spartakiad was meant to recruit every worker athlete from all over the world under the, the same red banner for the united front against capitalism and imperialism. This particular postcard was a striking and direct visual call in German and Russian for the militarization of physical culture, both for men and women, and thus, and thus referred to principles of the first All Union Spartakiad as an international call for the global class struggle for all genders. On Kruchi's postcards, both men and women break the laws of gravity. On the postcard composition, they are floating in the air through the power of sport. They are giants who suppress Lenin in size. They take part in athletic competitions together. They march shoulder to shoulder at political demonstrations, and they hold joint, joint rifle training sessions to train to become soldier, soldiers of the revolution. Both men and women athletes are represented here as a figure of the Novi, Novi Cheloviek, the new human being, and the personification of a young athletic worker who is guided by the notion of the immorality of Lenin. Lenin also had exp expressed his support for women participating in sports, and I quote, it is an urgent task to draw working women to sport. If we can achieve that and get them to make full use of the sun, water and fresh air for fortifying themselves, we shall bring an entire revolution to the Russian way of life." End of quote. Placed in a central position, uh, here the discus thrower is a giant figure who might have been regarded as a new sporting symbol in contrast to the most famous sporting depiction in art, the ancient male discobolos sculpture by Miron. Her effigy suppress, suppresses in its sights uh, even that of Lenin, who even rises from the dead to admire the Spartakiad, as suggested by the crooked mausoleum on Red Square. On Kluchy's Spartakiad series, the figures of women athletes very often dominate the whole composition. 
on a postcard presenting a relay race, a female athlete at the center receives the, real, uh, the relay button from one man and prepares to pass it to another man, thus indicating that in communist sport, gender division would no longer apply. Everyone was equ equally up to the overreaching idea of fighting for communism. Both men and women must train to be soldiers of the future universal revolution. The emphasis on gender equality was in this case simultaneously aimed at the misogyny of the International Olympic Committee, which banned women for, from participating in track and field competition in the first eight editions of the Olympic Games. Women were only permitted to participate in track and field, beginning with the ninth Games in Amsterdam in 1928. Already from its first edition in Moscow, the first All-Union Spartakiad promoted the world of women's athletics. In his letter to Kulagina on August 6, 1928, uh, Kluchis emphasized how much he wanted to attend the Spartakiad. He also urged his companion to come to, come to Moscow and to go with him to the opening ceremony on Parat on Red Square. Altef Although I have not come across any mention of Kluchy's personal impressions of the actual Spartakiad in his correspondence or otherwise, it would be interesting to ascertain whatever it corresponded to his artistic projections. But in lieu of his personal account of the largest communist worker sport event, his postcard assembled from press photos that precede the start of the Spartakiad function sometimes as a visual document of this event. For art historians and historians of the avant-garde, these postcards would become the primary visual representation of the event, more widely seen than the series of about 20 or so films documenting the Spartakiad, or the written and visual documentation published in the form of the official report uh, in 1928 and entitled The First All-Union Spartakiad Moscow 1928 and The Winter Workers Spartakiad Oslo. The book was edited by Vladimir Mikhels and designed by Vsevolodov, uh, Vsevolod uh, Filipov, Aviar Chernomordik and Nikolai Shabayev, who had a large amount of documentary material at their disposal from all possible photographic agencies and published by the Moscow's most influential publishing house related to sport, Fiskultura i Sport. Unlike the postcards created, created for the second Spartakiad in Prague and the official report of the Moscow event, the Spartakiad series by Kluchis entered the canon of the avant-garde studies. It was mainly because it was the work by Kluchis who is regarded as a prominent representative of constructivist aesthetics. His Spartakiad series, however, was in fact on the margins of the visual propaganda of the Moscow event. And there are some testimonies that his work was probably not highly appreciated by the RSI authorities. In support of this conjuncture is the fact that the artist was late with producing the postcards and did not finish them in time to promote uh, the event before it was underway. I do not come across what was the edition of the postcards, but in fact not many of them survived to this day. I did not come across that the workers' press in Russia, like Fiskultura e Sport, repro reproduced them, and if they also circulated outside of Russia. They were neither reproduced in German IZ, nor in Rotterstern, neither in Czechoslovak Noverusko and other communist propaganda magazines. As far as I came across, reprodu reproductions of Kluchy's series appeared only on the last page of the official report on the first All-Union Spartakiad edited by Mikhels in a very unconspicuous place, here like above. Uh, additionally, they were featured in a notably small format at the end of the official report, which was not designed by Kluchy's, but uh, uh, I mean the report. <laughs> Uh, but art is connected to the magazine Fiskultura e Sport. It seemed that Kluchis would be deemed the most suitable person to design the official report, but it was not the case, and he did not receive this commission, nor for other major commissions from RSI, organizing committees, for the visual propaganda of workers' sport events in the following years. There are much evidence to suggest that the nine postcards by Kluchis might have aroused concerns from the RSI management.
First of all, uh, he visualized particular disciplines which would not be included in the competition program. Among the highly bourgeois sporting disciplines, not only tennis, but also equestrian sports, which was very much associated with Olympic Games contests and had nationali nationalist connotations with military training outside of Soviet Russia. Secondly, the colors Kluchis has chosen for the composition of postcards, blue, green, red, yellow, black and white, were in fact precisely the same colors of the five circles on the background of the Olympic flag, as, a con as conceived by Baron Pierre de Coubertin. The R RSI uh, might also have been concerned with the coloristic composition of the postcard with female discus thrower. While there is a dominant red on the upper left-hand side, in the lower right there is a geometric composition of a re rectangle format with a yellow and a blue, which in fact evoked the colors of the Ukrainian national flag, but upside down, that had been banned by communists since 1917. On the cover of the third issue of the magazine Spartakiada, on which the same composition of discus thrower appeared, the yellow and blue were in fact replaced by red. The Spartakiad series might testify to the fact that pure to the first Union Spartakiad, Kluchis was, Kluchis was not much familiar with the sporting culture in Soviet Russia. But on the other hand, he clearly expressed the main postulates of the Red Sport International. This is gender equality through sports, the militarization of physical culture, and the collectivity of worker sport linked with proletarian mass culture. The use of photomontage created also a dynamic feeling of the communist sporting event, which he envisioned, but not documented. The juxtaposed uh, photographs represented different states and stages of dynamic motion, including bodily movement, competing athletes, moving machines and motorcycles. In, con in contrast, the official motifs on postcards and posters preceding the Olympic Games in Amsterdam were very much traditional, focused on individual and predominantly male sporting records. The design by the Dutch artist Joseph Johannes Rovers uh, showed a lonely male runner and the Olympic Stadium in Amsterdam, designed by a former The Style artist Jan Wils. The use of photomontage in Kluchy's postcards, as well as gender equality and collectivity, stand in striking contrast to the postcards for the Olympic Games. And even if they were probably not much praised by the RSI, and most probably did not take advantage, advantage of its potential for mass circulation, they are in fact the most known example of the engagement of avant-garde artists in the worker sports movement. And at the end of this paper, I would only like uh, to indicate two projects for, for the Kluchy Spartakiad, uh, which I do not discuss. The, the first one is in collection of Museum of Modern Art. Its size is bigger, but actually it does not fit either the colors nor the dynamics of the nine postcards. And here the smiling woman would be the only person not in sporting action, actually. <laughs> and also the lay layout of the name Spartakiada does not actually fit the layout of other Kluchy's compositions. And the dots which are featured in the name RSI are much more higher. I mean, I'm, I have kind of doubts if it's like really uh, the work of uh, Kluchy's, uh, especially when we think about uh, those postcards written in German, but when he made the postcard in German, his name was always in German, Kluzis, and here the, his name is in Russian. So, but um, I, I have a little bit concerns about these uh, two projects, if this is really a work by Kluzis, but since I don't know their provenance history right now, I cannot fully judge that they are not and they might have been just projects by Kluchis, which he ultimately rejected. Thank you very much. Hello. <laughs> if there's some um, 
some listeners online. I just want to remind, remind you that you can raise yeah. your digital hand and we will uh, we will hear your question uh, in the room. Hi. Thank you very much uh, to both of you for your presentations. Um, they were very interesting. I have a question for Jessica, or two maybe questions actually. Um, so thank you very much again. It was very interesting. And I just wanted to know, maybe you said it, but I'm not sure. Was it only paintings that were reproduced on the postcards of Der Sturm uh, specifically? And if yes, was it deliberate? Um, for example, why not drawings since they were paper and you know um and my second question uh, is about the album so i think you said they were uh, commercialized by the Sturm as well and i was wondering about their format and so on what did they look like do, do we know <laughs> and i mean for example uh, were they big enough to have several postcards on the page or was it one postcard on each page and you know for horizontal or vertical presentation and so on, so that's it, thank you. Does it, oh yes, it, oh, wow, uh, thank you uh, for those questions. Um, very good, I, I realize that uh, I should have been more clear about what was actually reproduced on those postcards. It was not only uh, paintings, they did reproduce uh, drawings, uh, graphic works, and uh, as we saw, two sculptures occasionally also. We had the sculptures by William Vauer, but also they represented uh, Aishipenko, for example, so many of his sculptures were reproduced as well. Um, and as regards the albums, um, as far as I know, Sturm itself did not trade it in the albums, but people would use the kind of standardized albums that were sort of used for other kinds of postcards as well. And, and, and it all has its sort of uh, grounds in the kind of uh, collecting activities that were developed in relation to the Carte Visit during the 19th century, where you had sort of these collections of portrait photographs of celebrities and royalties and family and friends assembled in, in a very peculiar way. Um, and most of those albums had sort of pages where you put two or four images on one side. They were sort of standardized formats, so it's, it's all prepared for you, just sort of include the images. But you, obviously you can arrange them in any kind of order and, and any kind of context, uh, so the images would appear in different contexts. Later on I've seen that in the 1930s, for example, with um, picture postcards uh, in color as well. There were whole series with sort of collectibles of uh, modern art uh, isms. With uh, these were not spread by the storm, but um, they were included in sort of series that. <laughs> there were also there were special albums that worked as kind of encyclopedias because the, the, the series that you could uh, assemble there were not only art, there were sort of uh, images from different parts of the world, different kinds of activities and so on. So sort of a source of general knowledge, really. Yeah. Uh, did it sort of, sort of answer your question? Yeah, perfectly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for asking. Thank you very much for both um, very, very interesting papers. I'd like to um, uh, follow up and ask uh, Jessica about um, whether copyright issues, or are we talking about way before copyright was introduced? And um, if that's the case, more generally, did the, um, did the artists themselves, did the Kandinsky's and the Chagall's benefit from the commercial um, dimension of these um, sales, of, the, of these commodities. Thank you. Uh, very interesting question. As far as I know, there were, there were absolutely no questions about the, the, the copyright. Uh, the, uh, 
I think on the contrary that many artists were sort of happy that uh, the gallery would reproduce their images and sort of spread them. Um, but they did not uh, get a share of the commercial part at all. Uh, in fact, I think that Chagall, for instance, he wasn't even aware of this because uh, he had his first one-man show in the gallery just on the verge of the, uh, of the First World War. So he had to leave in haste, uh, leave Germany, and his paintings were left behind in Berlin. So during the war, without the knowledge of the artist, Der Sturm actually established Chagall in Germany, so it was only afterwards that he sort of knew <laughs> he could come back. And um, as for the says, he, he didn't see anything. And both Chagall and Kandinsky, uh, they also uh, sued lawsuits against Herbert Walden in, in the interwar years due to sort of his business, uh, his, some, some suspicion of, of shady business uh, uh, in, in the gallery. So, Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, for two excellent talks. Um, I wondered, and this is for both, uh, both speakers really, um, to what extent artists could subvert the institutions and organizations' intentions for the postcard at the point of production. So rather than retrospectively, to what extent were they involved in the production of, of, these, of these objects? Yeah, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, the um, RSI, the Red Sport International, commissioned Kluchis to design the postcards. Uh, I didn't came across if they had, uh, they wanted to involve themselves how the postcards might have looked like, but I think not. That's why Kluchis included so many sporting disciplines which were actually not in the Spartakiada program like equestrian sports, like tennis, they were not in the program. So actually, uh, I think the artists got, yeah, he was free to do whatever he wants. Uh, I was wondering why had, why they have chosen Kluchis to, to design the postcards. Uh, in 1923, he designed one, po <coughs> one photo, he created one photomontage entitled Sport for the proletarian magazine. Maybe this was the case, uh, but uh, I think, and this is my conclusion, that actually they didn't really approve what he was doing. And um, I also don't know how, uh, what was the addition of the postcards. I, but they are so rare, I don't know. If you think about uh, the postcards of the Olympic Games, for example, in Amsterdam, you can buy them everywhere, eBay, Amazon, uh, on every auction, uh, in the internet, or <laughs> everywhere, but the Spartakiad by Kluchis, they are missing somehow. I don't know, like, I, I couldn't find uh, much of them. The postcards from Prague also, you can find it everywhere on auctions, on eBay, from Prague, from the second Spartakiad, but the Kluchis one, they are really, really rare, and uh, I don't know what is the, the idea here. But uh, yeah, I think, but answering your question, uh, I think uh, he was free to do whatever he wants. But at the end, it was not the case of the, what they wanted, actually. Thank you. <laughs> well, I could shortly uh, add, uh, I don't think that um, the Sturm artists that have uh, actually involved in the production or see uh, they saw the postcards that, as aesthetic objects like that, perhaps with the exception of uh, the futurist artists. But um, I think that in that case, Havat Walden learned from the futurist artists sort of inclination for creating a public stir. We know that when they visited Berlin for the exhibition, they drove together in an open car through the streets, sort of spreading propaganda on the streets. So, so I think it's more that kind of uh, gesture. And also I think that the, 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 the texts on the postcards of the Futurists, they were actually stemming from the Futurist artists themselves because they wrote the catalogue. So there I think it was 
their interest in creating sort of kunst propaganda for themselves, but not aesthetically as objects for sort of elaborating or transgressing the pictorial means, but, but as, as uh, advertising, really. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Could I ask uh, about the captions um, on the postcards? Because um, <coughs> I find that quite <laughs> intriguing. Um, and after the First World War, when Walden starts to promote more and more abstract art, uh, I don't know if there was a, a production of, of abstract art postcards, but I would be interested to know if there were captions uh, on that and descriptions of of abstract art and, and uh, yeah, if it exists and, and how it is described. Thank you, thank you. Um, yes, there were reproductions of, of abstract uh, artworks, definitely. I mean, the first ones were the kinds of the Kandinsky uh, executed, but um, the descriptive texts only occur in relation to the futurist artist. Um, and I think it's, it might have to do with sort of Havat Walden's uh, art theoretical position because his position was that words were not necessary in uh, when you were to receive artworks. He constantly returns to the fact that the public has to see the artworks and the words of the critics, which is ironic really, because he's an art critic himself, but he, he sees the words of the critics as unnecessary. So he doesn't want the text, really. Uh, and that might explain why there, there are no such words on, or explanations on the other cards. Mm. Um, yes, hello. Um, thank you for your, for your talks. Uh, I have a question for both, actually, uh, about the uh, Der Sturm photo, uh, postcards. I was interested to know more about the, the war period, what happens between the war, if there is uh, edition of postcards, of artistic postcards related to the conflict by Der Sturm. And uh, um, concerning Clutis, uh, um, I would be interested to know more about the, the printing technique, if you know, I mean, the, the MoMA website says it's an uh, offset lithograph, but if you look closely, it looks like half tone. I was just interested to know if you were, if you had uh, an information. And, and also, uh, it's interesting, the, the idea of uh, <coughs> the, abol the abolition of gravity, those, those uh, floating bodies in abstract space. And uh, so maybe you could say more about the relation to maybe suprematism and how, how, how Clutis deal with this heritage of abstract art in, this, in, his, in his later work. I mean, uh, does, he, does he write about it, the, this idea of abstract space? <laughs> Thank you uh, for that question. Um, there was no special um, series of postcards produced only uh, for sort of war purposes or war propaganda purposes, but uh, the Sturm would use their postcards that they already had uh, in order to contribute to a more positive sort of uh, attitude toward the Germans when they were traveling in the Scandinavian countries. Uh, in Germany, Sturm was quite uh, clear in public that they did not sort of uh, mix art and politics. They were an art organization only uh, in, in, in contrast to, for example, the rivaling journal Die Aktion, who sort of um, explicitly uh, spoke about political issues. The Sturm did not. Uh, but when uh, the Walden couple was... Uh, traveling in, in the neutral countries, in Scandinavia, for example, if you read sort of the interviews with them in the, in the Swedish press, it's quite clear that they, they are openly sort of uh, admitting that they are working for the, the German authorities. They provide um, uh, sort of pro-German news for the Scandinavian press, and they use their images to sort of spread the idea uh, 
that uh, the Germans are not those uncultivated barbarians that were sort of rumors that were circulating at the time, but the Germans had the ability to see that art and culture has nothing to do with politics. So. Um, answering your question, thank you very much for, for your question. Uh, when I was uh, looking at the postcards of Spartakiad, uh, I used two sources. Like first source was the Latvian Museum of Modern Art uh, in Riga. They have original um, uh, original works before it got turned into a postcard. So uh, it was a, like a like a real photo montage and colored pencil. And uh, when it comes to uh, the photographs uh, produced. Uh, produced as postcards, uh, the photomontages produced as postcards, uh, I, I thought it's off offset, but uh, maybe, maybe you're right that it's uh, another technique. Uh, this is the um, one, one uh, answer to your question. The other answer, it's about the suprematism and the floating uh, images of uh, sport, uh, of athletes. Um, I think um, the idea of Kluchis was much more uh, to look into photomontage as a real visual representation. I mean, he used, he cut out the images of, of athletes from various press. Uh, so it was like always figurative sportsmen, uh, athletes on the uh, kind of more abstract background, but not always. Uh, when we think about Malevich, for example, um, and Lisicki, who created uh, works of uh, athletes as entirely abstract paintings, for example, dynamism of a, um, a painterly dy dynamism of a football player by Malevich, uh, the suprema suprematist composition um, was entirely <coughs> abstract without any figurative uh, references. Here in uh, Kluchi's uh, postcards, we see always um, always male and female. They are always like, somehow mixed together. Uh, this was his idea to show this gender equality because when we think about the sport history, we always need to remember that uh, women were not allow, allowed to participate in the Olympic Games uh, in the track and field until 1928, so since for 30 years almost. Um, the idea of the floating uh, figures um, can somehow more relate maybe to Lisicki and his idea of Praun as this uh, kind of a cosmic uh, reality without gravity. I, I remember he also produced one uh, work called Footballer um, in 1922 uh, where he um, cut out the image of a footballer and placed it on the background of a brown composition. And somehow a soccer, a, a sun, yes, like in the cosmic dimension, resembles a ball and he's somehow floating towards uh, this ball as Icarus <laughs> towards the sun. Uh, but yeah, like um, this idea of um, breaking the, the gravity, I think it was important to show the athletes as a superheroes, as a collective, uh, as a collectivity of, of, of people who thanks to the physical culture and to training, because we also need to remember that in Soviet sports, uh, the militarization of physical culture was so strong that it was always very much connected to the to the idea of the global class struggle. I mean, the sports training and military training was sometimes the same. Uh, so, uh, and also at the Spartakiad, Spartakiad opened with the uh, training of Red Army and uh, Red Army was very much present there at the, at the event. Uh, so this was all, um, I think, related to this idea uh, that uh, through sports, through physical culture, through military training, 
uh, the workers, ordinary workers, are becoming somehow superheroes. So they, they are break. They are even bigger in size than Lenin. Yes, on this on this postcard. So they are anonymous on one side, but on the other hand, they are just breaking the laws of gravity to show their superpower in in, in this context. And the um, the abstract uh, background, uh, I think this might be a kind of a play mar much more with Lisitsky's idea of Brown than like the traditional suprematism of Malevich where he excluded entirely the, uh, the figurative uh, images. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Can you can you also just say if they were meant to be distributed uh, in Germany, because if the texts are in German? Uh, this, this I didn't, uh, I couldn't find this uh, information, but for example, the Prague um, postcards uh, on the back side, the, they were, um, it was in French, in uh, Polish, and G Polish, I don't know why, <laughs> because the worker sport movement was not so big in Poland, but anyway, uh, uh, Czech and German, and uh, Russian, the, the um, Kluczy Spartakiad postcards, were only in Russian on the other side. So I was wondering um, if uh, the Russian on the other, like the Cyrillic uh, letters on the other side, I think it was much more uh, very locally distributed. I've, yes, this is what, what is my suspicion. Uh, why German? I think it's a good also um, kind of reference I can make because Red Sport International, the organization, w the main secretary was uh, Fritz Reusner, he was a German. And actually the second Spartakiad was supposed to be uh, held in Berlin in 1931, but it was canceled due to the po uh, political reasons because the Spartakiads were so much connected to Comintern politics that outside of Russia, all the countries feared that you know, this infiltration of Comintern politics in Germany and in Czechoslovakia the same. That's why the second Spartakiad in Prague was cancelled and only the postcard survived. Uh, so, so there's nothing in the archive saying that the, the commission uh, commissioned that uh, specifically for foreign countries to promote the the Soviet Spartakiads in, in Germany, in Western Europe? Yeah, I mean, uh, because I also researched the, um, the sport magazines in, in Germany, and for example, I, or the proletarian magazines, uh, like IZ, Arbeiter Illustrierte Zeitung, they made so many, so much of coverage of, of Spartakiad in Moscow, in German, or Rotterstern, like all the communist-linked magazines in Germany, in Czechoslovakia, they reported on Spartakiad. Uh, very extensively, but they didn't feature the Kluchy's postcards, actually. So, um, if they featured uh, photomontages, they were made by someone else. Uh, I mean, as far as I researched the, the communist press in Germany and in Czechoslovakia, because outside of uh, Russia, the Red Sport International had the biggest influence in Germany and in Czechoslovakia and partly in Hungary. So in Hungary there are also some references to the Spartakiad in the communist magazines. Uh, but uh, yeah, when it comes to the, the Kluci sport card, postcard, for me it's very interesting that like all what we know about Spartakiad, uh, I mean if we don't, uh, how can I say it, if we don't research very deep, all of what we know about Spartakiad is the postcards of Kluchis, actually. But this is not the, this was also art, only an artistic projection, not documentation. Like, it was mm -hmm. totally, um, Spartakiad was totally something different that uh, Kluchis projected artistically. Uh, I also would like to ask you, Jessica, one question. Um, I was curious about uh, who was doing the photographs for the uh, Sturm series, you mean the, the portraits? Mm -hmm. And because, as I observed, a lot of portraits were very traditional, like very traditional portraits of the, um, of the artists, 
but only one was avant-garde, like the portrait of Walden, uh, which was like very closed up, uh, like without his whole head. Mm -hmm. It was very much avant-garde uh, kind of photograph, but the others were very traditional. Is it like, do you think it's, it, it has a meaning or uh, who did the photographs? I mean. <laughs> Thank, uh, thank you for that question. Um, in part we know, and in part we don't know. Uh, the ones that I sort of managed to, to uh, identify, they are usually sort of normal portrait photographers with studios. Um, uh, one woman called Marta Wolf, for example, so who did the, uh, who took the photograph of Oskar Kokoschka. Uh, it might have been the Nicolas Perscheid. Uh, who did the Walden photograph? I, I'm I'm not quite sure. It might have been, uh, but I think it it um, it also depends on how. It, I, I mean, you can cut the, the photograph uh, when you reproduce it, so that might be sort of an intervention from Walden himself. How how sort of narrow he wants the image to be. Um, as for Nell Walden, she she employs sort of several. Uh, women photographers in the interwar years uh, later on and uh, many of them were also sort of experimental photographs for for example Elsa Neuland uh, Simon uh, most known as Eva who also sort of experimented with with um, avant-garde photography but most of them were sort of the the normal ones that you would take uh, at a normal photographer's <laughs> uh, studio and most of them look like this with sort of uh, a neutral background and only the face. Uh, the only one that I've seen sort of apart from Walden who has this sort of intense look uh, and, and narrow uh, image um, sort of the surface uh, is the one that they reproduced by uh, showing Alexander Archipenko because that is the only one showing an artist uh, in work. He's standing with a sculpture uh, in his hand and sort of looks at it, sort of posing as the professional sculpture. Uh, but the others uh, are the normal ones. Mm -hmm. Do we have time for yet another question? May I also? Because, because I, want to, <laughs> I wanted to pose a question to you as well because I was... Um, it, it has often struck me when I've sort of, uh, been looking at the postcard and, uh, and also other material that um, pictorial languages or artistic practices that uh, somehow um, challenge uh, conventional norms are sometimes more easily accepted if they are sort of uh, if they occur in areas beyond the art world beyond the art gallery or the museum or the institution. Uh, for example, on postcards or in shop windows or on applied arts uh, or things like that. Have you seen something similar with the photo montage technique, uh, which I suspect was not as easily acceptable in an art gallery setting or sort of within the confines of the fine art world, but could be accepted when it sort of turns up in, in on postcards and printed material. Would that be true also uh, in relation to your material? Uh, you are also asking if, for example, the postcards were exhibited at that time? Yeah. yeah um, Mm, that's a very good question, um, because as also um, I came across this correspondence of Kulagina and Kluchis, who was saying that he's uh, working on the postcards several weeks. Yes, like so, uh, it was very huge, intense work, and he even didn't meet the deadline imposed by RSI. So it was like really intensive work. I think. Uh, he needed to make them small, the figures smaller, the figures bigger. I mean, it was like really artistic production we cannot even imagine at uh, that time. <laughs> so, um, for sure, it was uh, very artistically and aesthetically uh, important for him. If it was uh, exhibited, I don't know. I, I didn't come across, but it is a very good question because since Duchamp, we ask ourselves what constitutes the artwork. It's like the artwork, the work which is exhibited. Uh, but uh, here, um, 
For example, uh, there was this uh, um, big uh, press uh, exhibition in Cologne in 1928, but I don't remember uh, which date was that. I think it was before the Spartakiad. So actually, it was not there, and uh, yeah, like I, I didn't come across if this was exhibited. As far as I know, um, there was an exhibition during the Spartakiad because. Uh, for example, during the Olympic Games, there were Olympic art exhibitions. Uh, and uh, during the Spartakia, there was an exhibition uh, organized in the building of the Institute of Physical Culture. So not in the museum, but in the mm -hmm. Institute of Physical Culture. I saw some photographs. Uh, I haven't seen them, the, uh, the postcards of Kluchis. But maybe they were. I mean, I, I didn't uh, research much more the reviews, but I found one review, <coughs> and, and there were no mention about uh, Kluge's postcards. I mean, for me, it's kind of like very enigmatic, uh, this, <laughs> this story with those postcards that they kind of not really, I think not really, they were not... Uh, circulated somehow mm -hmm. so so much as other post I don't know like I think it's one of the conclusions <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you No questions. Um, the I think the technical team. There's no no one. No. Okay. Thanks.